Hey guys, what's going on? It's If You Have to Pick 3, I'm Matt. And I'm Zach. If you haven't joined us for one of these episodes before, I'm sorry, but thank you for coming. Um, we are posed... <laughs> you're, with... you're in for a huge surprise. Yes. <laughs> so for this show, what we do is we're posed with a list of three of something, and then we each pick a top three list, and then we fight out for a final top three list, and there we go. So... This one is a little bit different than what we normally do. Is Zach, it though? It is. Why don't you let them know what we're doing? Well, let me tell you some, brother. Any clues? Uh, <laughs> surprise. Rock and just music in general has always had a fun relationship with professional wrestling. Oh, yeah, brother. Oh, yeah. And the truth of the matter is I was much more of a wrestling fan as a kid. But especially more recently uh, with AEW coming into the picture, I've slowly started to get back into it and slowly started to remember how, as much as I might be embarrassed to admit this, there is a lot of bands and music that if it wasn't for wrestling, I don't know if I would have found out about them at such an early age. It's in a weird way, and not just for metal or rock either, even hip hop in a lot of different genres whether it was WWE or then WWF or WCW, they those Nitro and Raw, those programs found a fun way to almost introduce bands that would end up becoming some of our favorites. And because WrestleMania, this is the biggest time of year for wrestling, if you think about it, it's coming up. We decided, let's name the three coolest music-related moments in wrestling. Okay. Does that sound good to you? I mean, we could do that. And maybe even before we go further. So I just bared my soul when Mm -hmm. it came to my past fandom of wrestling. Mm -hmm. Matt, what was your, uh, were you into wrestling growing up? Am I forcing you to do something that's very uncomfortable? No, no. See, for me, wrestling was something that I found through my grandfather. He watched it all the time. So then I naturally, you know, picked it up in the, uh, the mid to late eighties. And obviously some people think of it as one of the greatest times in wrestling history. So Hulk Hogan, Macho Man, Ultimate Warrior, you know, things like that in WWF. And then, you know, that kind of continued on uh, for a little bit and then I fell off. And then when the attitude era of WWE was, um, I want to say like it's midpoint to like when it switched over to ruthless aggression in like, uh, like the early two thirties, thousands yeah. i think you know kurt angle and um you know when edge started to become real popular eddie guerrero chris benoit you know before he did his thing Ugh. anyway yeah, um but then i kind of dropped off and then you know with seeing things on youtube with this new aew promotion and you know chris jericho kind of being the figurehead of the whole organization it got a little interesting so you know while I'm, i don't actively really watch it all that much anymore i still know uh, a decent amount of you know wrestling and i have wrestling knowledge of things going on so no this is not outside of my wheelhouse you know i also um i feel like for me getting to grow up and become a fan of wrestling in the late 90s early two, and on the cusp of the of the 2000s was arguably the best time to be a wrestling fan because not only did you have WWE then WWF fight WCW the the Monday Night Wars mm-hmm. between Nitro and Raw not only did you have that going on in real time not the bad crossover and yeah exactly um but not only did you have that in real time but then you also had the VHS boom in that w, what WWF did so incredible was really archive their major events right around. I think whenever they're celebrating the 15th anniversary, they literally released every single WrestleMania up to that point on VHS. Um, and then even then, like in the age of blockbuster, being able to go to blockbuster and rent out the 1989 Royal rumble yep. or the 1991 SummerSlam and being able to discover the old school pay-per-views so you had the best of both worlds. You had it being at the height of its popularity and then also its history and being able just to before the internet. And it's interesting because it's like, but you had that way to get encompassed into wrestling back then, but now it's whole, all different that you can just watch everything on YouTube. Yeah. And one of the things, um, just going back a little bit, one of the last ones that I actually watched on 
uh, on DVD was the rise and fall of ECW years ago when that first came out. You want to talk about a promotion that did an incredible job introducing music. Oh, and I act. It was ECW. Uh, I... Uh, I actually found ECW by accident. I forget what channel I was watching. I was like up at like two in the morning and they were just running wrestling. And it was something so different than anything that I saw before. I immediately kind of latched onto it and I thought it was pretty cool. So, um, yeah, I found ECW really, uh, like really by accident, but to, to see it on DVD, um, and watch the entire history of the company. And I think it was one of the biggest DVDs that WWE ever released. Yeah. yeah. It's part. I mean, uh, even just the soundtrack and the entrance themes, which apparently, which were actually real music. It wasn't apparently like, apparently used without permission too. Which is yeah. Funny here. But, it was, it wasn't like uh diamond Dallas page using like a cut up version <laughs> of Nirvana. <laughs> Woo. Ooh, do, 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 do. No, but like even just like hearing the Sandman come out to enter Sandman. Yeah. I digress. We are here to discuss the coolest music moments of wrestling history. Matt, start us off with your three. Okay. So we're going to start out with uh, probably the newest. We're going to start out with Chris Jericho using his own band, Fozzie's Music. Um if you don't know the track Judas, that's his entrance music. And the reason why I say that this is one of the most iconic or one of the biggest moments in music and wrestling is because you really start to see the wrestler not only own his character, but really he can kind of tailor his character in any way he chooses. Normally, you know, they go through a creative process with the wrestler and how, you know, the, the music fits in with the theme and whatnot. And yeah, it, they might work with talent to kind of get to that. But now you see that creative, that piece of the creative being taken into the, the hands of the wrestler himself. Chris Jericho and the band Fozzie can now literally record anything and use that in any way that he chooses because it's him who's doing the music creation and him doing the invention of the character that might go with the music. So I think it really kind of plays into that. Now, going right into my number two moment. Actually, before you mm -hmm. do, I want to add something to that Chris Jericho moment. Mm -hmm. The fact that fans are now singing along to, along to it. Yeah. It started with a recent episode of AEW Dynamite that was filmed on Chris Jericho's Rock and Wrestling Major Cruise. And literally, as he was coming out, the fans were singing along to it, and it just stuck. That's the kind of, like if you were ever a wrestler, you want people to be singing along to your anthem. But it just, it's it his, it's his music, though. Oh, it's and it makes not it, just no, absolutely. It's not just him having somebody else create the music for him, and then they're singing along with it. No, this is Chris Jericho cross promoting Fozzy, and then people finding Fozzy, and now all of that back catalog that goes with that. It's literally a fan's dream come true, if you think about it. Just all of it. Just being the champion, coming out to your own song, like literally your own voice, like having fans sing along of it. It's just, that's what every wrestling fan would love to happen in real life. Oh, absolutely. And, and come true. Right. And you know, it's not cheesy vocals. It's, yeah, some people might say, well, John Cena has his whole rap and whatnot. Yeah, but if if anybody caught you listening to John Cena's uh, uh, Thugonomics <laughs> hip hop or his new theme music, like if you're driving, it's like that's kind of cheesy, bro. Yeah. That's kind of cheesy. But but now with Chris Jericho and a legitimate established band, his own band, yeah. who he goes on tour with and actively is this rock machine, it's like well, that's a whole different thing, and that's actually kind of cool. But I, I interrupted. I apologize. Right. So now I'm going to go into my second one where I think this is probably one of the most iconic pairings ever. And it's going to be with Triple H and Motorhead. Mm. Because you had Triple H for years. He, wa he had like that whole blue blood aristocratic type feel. And then when he started to become a little more badass, he had that weird intro that almost kind of sounded siren-like. And it was rock-ish. It was okay. It wasn't great. But then he and Lemmy became such good friends and he, you know, was kind of trying to tailor his character to uh, some music. So when he went ahead and got this new Motorhead track and it was really good. And Motorhead even released it on, I believe it was their Hammered album. 
from back in the late 90s, I want to say. It's just got, like, it looks like a lapel pin for, like, the, the military. It's just, like, a, a gold uh, Iron Maiden logo, or not Iron Maiden, um, Motorhead logo. I forget what the album's actually called, but if you go on that album, it's actually on there. With him coming out to this new music, it really created one of the most iconic entrances in wrestling history, in addition to one of the most badass songs ever created for an intro, because around that time, there were other people who were trying to do the same thing, maybe a little bit later, like, um, I think it was Batista who had saliva. That was okay. It didn't really work as well as Triple H. Who was the other one that did something like, like CM Punk had the cult of personality. A lot of artists have tried. Right, a lot of artists have tried, but nothing is really stuck to the level that Triple H and Motorhead kind of fuse this thing together. And then Motorhead themselves became a little bit more ingrained in WWE with uh, the evolution theme. And then Triple H is, I guess you want to call it alternative theme, uh, theme the King of Kings. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that that fusion of a creative idea to the perfect music track just works. So that's number two. And then number three is a little bit different. It's not just an entrance-based idea that I came up with for this one. I saw a really interesting interview with Triple H um, over the NXT brand. And he talked about the fusion of metal and rock into this new NXT brand. Because from what I know of NXT, because this is where I start to get a little fuzzy... NXT was this like gimmicky game show type thing that they filmed beforehand of, you know, I think before like SmackDown or Mm -hmm. or Raw and, you know, Triple H said, hey, you know, I got this idea. Let me run with it. And, you know, Vince said, all right, shoot a pilot for it, shot a pilot for it. And it was, you know, great. And he wanted to take control of the brand. So he took control of the brand. And then because he wanted it to be like that alternative underground type feel to it. Well, he always loved rock music, obviously, with him, you know, having a friendship with Lemmy from Motorhead for years and years. Um, He kind of played off of that, you know, that love of rock and metal and melded rock and metal into what NXT would become. So you have this whole brand new promotion whose entire existence is kind of melted together with rock and metal and then having certain bands come out of that and and build on that like uh i think bring me the horizon was one of them code orange was another one code of them orange is actually the first band to perform at an nxt uh, right event, which is really cool right and i think they did that for alistair black yeah okay so for all of this um they they've they've melded the world of rock and underground so now this is almost like another outlet to go to find out cool new music uh, another one that is kind of different and it's a little bit more on the rock side than the metal side was Lizzie Hale um, um, doing Ember Moon mm-hmm. and her entrance. So you have this whole new way to find out, you know, kind of up and coming rock and metal bands. And, you know, if you just happen to like wrestling, you know, this might be the thing for you if you've never watched NXT or if you like rock and metal and you want to find out what's up and coming, you know, maybe watch this because this isn't, yeah, and and this is something funny that Triple H brought up in the interview was, you know, you have all of these indie films that are shot, but it's like, well, aren't you backed by Disney? Mm -hmm. So you kind of have that overproduction value to it where what they're trying to do is they try to keep the production just to a level enough where it's, all right, this is a legitimate product. It's not like... You know, it's backyard wrestling, you know, mm-hmm. underground. No, this is it's got like a legitimate production value to it, but they don't go over uh, over the top, like with like super CGI and all, all like effects and things like that. But they try to keep it to that level. So it feels like a legitimate underground product like ECW was. And now you have this cool soundtrack that goes along with it. So maybe you get wrestling along with finding out all of these new bands. So that's my three moments. So it's Chris Jericho and his Judas entrance theme, you know, bringing, finally bringing everything together between Fozzie and him, uh, Triple H and Motorhead for obvious reasons. And then the whole NXT brand and 
finding all of that new music inside of this cool new underground package. Very cool. All right. My three. I already I know I already kind of talked about this, but and I was kind of torn about maybe making my my final three, but you know what? No, it needs to be mentioned. The ECW Extreme Music 1998 soundtrack. Uh, as we mentioned before, ECW kind of like where what NXT is doing now, but with the actual artist involvement, uh, <laughs> because surprise, Metallica wasn't actually at these ECW events in Philadelphia and warehouses and everything. You mean they weren't? <laughs> Man. But everything that the WWE then WWF was trying to do the Attitude Era, a lot of people feel was kind of a slight ripoff of what ECW was doing, but with better production. And it's hard to argue that with that. I mean, they really went extreme and they found that, hey, if we're going to be extreme, we need loud music. And their 1998 soundtrack, well, granted, a lot of it was covers or in, uh, instrumental remixes because, surprise, they couldn't afford the original version. The fact that they had Lemmy with Zebrahead doing a cover of Enter Sandman or even Anthrax covering a, uh, Metallica's Phantom Lord. Um, and then having just a cover of The Zoo sang by Bruce Dickinson and a cover of Walk by Kilgore. These are, to the average metalhead, names or songs that are like, well, duh, those are classics. But to a young kid who maybe can't drive and can't really listen to what's on the radio, this is their first exposure to some of these heavier instant classics in, in extreme genre. Um, so I just think it speaks volumes that the soundtrack and the show itself was able to introduce like a lot of the heavier music. Um, even this was the first time I, so balls Mahoney's theme song was big balls by ACDC. Obviously they used the cover on the soundtrack, but that was the first time I heard that song. And I don't know if I really would have until years later heard that song because it wasn't like that was a big hit. Um, maybe a few DJs would play it ironically because it's a pretty silly and, uh, you know, not so PC song. But they're talking about like balls, like well, ball, like, yeah. like gowns and, and, and dancing and, arist yeah. and aristocracy and things Still like that. But, you, you know, know, it's not a popular topic either. <laughs> not as popular to you know, as testicles. it is. Not as popular as testicles. But anyway, um, so I just think that soundtrack especially deserves a lot of credit for being able to introduce younger or just less metal educated fans to some, a lot of bands and songs. And as we mentioned, even just like hearing walk or hearing enter salmon, when you hear those songs, sometimes once in a while you'll be like, huh, Rob Van Dam or huh, Sandman. Like it just like you picture them coming out to those songs. As much as we might talk about like, oh, that's my wrestling entrance songs. Like if you're a real wrestling fan, it's like, no, Walk is Off Limits. That's Rob Van Dam's. Like, nope, nothing by Metallica. That's Sam. It's so weird to see him now. Who? Oh, which one? Rob Van Dam. He it's sad. I, I watched, uh, He's to on, get ready for this, I was watching just different videos uh, of wrestling on YouTube. And to watch him cut a promo to like a room of 150 people when he, he, he can't get through it. It's like, oh, dude. It's sad. He's trying this Charlie Sheen gimmick with two. One of them is, I guess, actually his wife, and then just some other model. I don't know. It was it it's was sad. Awkward. And he just also came. Out, he also just confirmed that he's had like hundreds of concussions. Well, that doesn't surprise me. Like he should not be in the ring. Well, I mean, look at how many chair shots he's taken to the head over the years. Yeah, it's a little much. All right, so that was my first one. Second one is going to be a huge departure from what we've been kind of talking about. But it's still extremely important to talk about this. Because while today, if I mentioned Cindy Lauper, you wouldn't necessarily think wrestling. You would think of psoriasis. Yes. <laughs> That's, I was going to just say sheep up. But okay, yeah, no, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. But you got to remember that in the 80s, not only was she one of the biggest stars... But she and uh, her then partner, David Wolf, were massive wrestling supporters to the point that she not only hired Hulk Hogan as her, quote, bodyguard to accompany her to the Grammys, she even had Captain Lou Albana, uh, Albano 
in her vid- music video for Girls Just Want to Have Fun as the father. Mm-hmm. And then because of that, she actually even promoted her music on WWF programming and then actually got into the storylines with Roddy, with Roddy Piper. And she even then accompanied wrestlers to the ring for a few years. Most famous, though, was at the very first WrestleMania where Cindy Lauper um, accompanied Wendy Richard to the ring uh, at her women's title match. And if you think about it, that's a huge deal because not only did one of the biggest pop stars of the time help promote what would end up being one of the biggest wrestling events of all time, but she also helped give a major exposure to women's wrestling on a pretty male-dominated card, and that's putting it nicely, too. Well, if you watch women's wrestling from back then, it is nothing in comparison to women's wrestling now. And even over the last few years, from my understanding, because I saw things with Ronda Rousey when she yeah. wrestled. Well, I mean, What's kind of nice is that wrestling, women's wrestling right now is kind of going back to, no, 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 these wrestlers are actually wrestlers. They're not just eye candy. They're here to compete. Right, and that's, that's what I think was very much so different back then because yeah. like you can and I remember watching some women's wrestling from back then because that's when I watched you know wrestling a little bit more than you know I do now but mm-hmm. it was they're like very stiff workers and you know that you know you're not going to get a real quality match like now it's the women are doing some things that the men aren't doing and it's refreshing it's yeah. nice to see that it's not you know you're Tori Wilson or Stacy Keebler, who were just there because they were in uh, Playboy. I think that was just Tori Wilson, not Stacy. But, you know, not that they're, like you said, eye candy. It's they're there to compete and to perform. And the fact that you have an MMA artist who actually wanted to do this and did do it, and they were keeping up with her because, yeah, they are athletes. I think the training is a little bit different for MMA than it is for wrestling. You know, call me crazy. But yeah, that that melding of the worlds and that they can keep up with, I, I'm not going to say it's not fake. People do get hurt. It is it's definitely not fake. It's scripted. There's a difference. Yeah. But MMA, you are trained to just go in for the kill, go, go for the kill, go for uh, a long time, go for, you know, power, go for, you know, Whereas different in- takedowns and, and things like that, where in wrestling, you're probably trained to take a bump really good. You're trained to, um, to perform in a certain way. You're trained very much so differently. And for those worlds to mesh and for the wrestlers to keep up with the MMA artists and vice versa. Well, it's, I'm about to say, it's interesting because there's a history of not many wrestlers are able to find success in MMA, MMA and vice versa. Not many MMA athletes are actually able to find success in wrestling. Right. And to see and the it's world's because it's so mel- different. Right. Because the worlds are now melding to a place where both of them might have some success because yeah. let's put it, you know, I think Ronda Rousey was champion for a little bit. Yeah. You know, it, it really shows how far that has actually come because yeah. if you had a woman who knew judo back in the eighties, go against a female wrestler in the 80s, uh, the judo person would kill them. So, but going back to Cindy Lauper real quick. So not only did she help put a spotlight and elevate women's wrestling on at WrestleMania, but she, and uh, I think this is going to be the first time any of either of us say Mr. T in our podcast, (laughs) but she and Mr. T, what are you talking about? (laughs) She and Mr. T set a precedent that, all right, WrestleMania is not just an average show. This is where all the big guns come out that even celebrities who aren't wrestlers want to be at this event. It's set a precedent for star power. And, yes. And pretty much at every WrestleMania following the first one, there would be at least some star power attached to it, whether they were just in the audience, whether it was Alice Cooper attend, you know, bringing Jake the Snake his snake at WrestleMania three or Pamela Anderson just being part of a storyline for some weird reason. Uh, I'm pretty sure that was the 94 WrestleMania. Either way, if it wasn't really for Cindy Lauper, I don't think major stars at the time would have seen wrestling as a way to reach other audiences. Um, or at least not take it seriously. Granted, there was even a point that Cindy Lauper was like, yeah, it's like t- after like a year or two, 
some people in the industry are starting to treat me like a wrestler. I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm an artist. Cut that crap out. Like, so I think it, maybe she even says it backfired, but the fact that she's actually, now granted, this is whether or not you think that the WWE Hall of Fame is a real thing or actually legit. Oh, it is a real thing. Well, it's it happens. A, they it's have a whole sorry, ceremony and everything. It's a real thing, but whether you think it's quote unquote really a prestigious thing and like actually like means something is up for the debate. Um, but the fact that like when it comes to like the celebrity, like each year they have like a celebrity who's had some sort of role in wrestling and gets inducted um, for their contributions and whatnot. The fact that Cindy Lauper is not in the hall of fame, whereas like kid rock or even Donald Trump is in the hall of fame for their silly little things involving wrestling, but not Cindy Lauper, who you could argue was the first huge celebrity other than Andy, Co- but Andy Kaufman's a different uh, thing, but it's a little disrespectful that Cindy Lauper is not in the hall of fame, whether or not you actually think it, the hall of fame matters. So that's my second one. Cindy Lauper's involvement in the eighties with wrestling. The third one. So I have to admit something. Two of yours, I really actually was considering putting on my final list. Well, then they should immediately make the final three. <laughs> maybe. Maybe. But I think I have to go with the bromance between Triple H and Motorhead. For a lot of what you discussed, forget the fact that if it wasn't for Triple H, Motorhead would never have been on WrestleMania. I mean, that's so cool that like Motorhead was on WrestleMania, performed yes. on WrestleMania. Mm-hmm. But whether or not you actually like Triple H, as soon as you hear the intro, to, you hear Lemmy going, time to play the game. The You see the entire arena go, oh, it's Triple H. Like, it's one of the most instantly recognizable theme songs in wrestling history. I would even put it as number one. Yes, and hands down, it's the most badass. It's the most recognizable. It's sorry if you're a fan of Hulk Hogan, but uh, no, his real American theme. It might be iconic. You, mean you don't like when he used Voodoo Child as Hollywood Hulk Hogan? It it wasn't. I mean, yeah, it was it was iconic for the time, but yeah. now it's like, well, no, it's what's, what song did what song did Hogan use when he was Hollywood Hogan? And some people are probably gonna go, uh, everybody Damn, knows real American. Man. Yeah, I know. But anyway, also. It kind of goes back to the when we were talking about even Chris Jericho, and, and you mentioned this a little bit too, but Triple H is a fan. And yeah. it fits him. And I think the fact that it's not just corporate saying, all right, so we got this song. Here you go. It was actually Triple H who chose Motorhead and who wanted that. And when he was actually going over like, all right, this new game persona that I have, I need a new theme song. And because, you know, WWE has like, they actually, they use some outsider recorders. There was a time even in the late 90s and early 2000s, they had studio session musicians on payroll, just completely dedicated to doing this. And he was working with them and he was like, "Ah, no, this is not right. I want it to sound like Motorhead. I want it to sound like this. And then suddenly I was like, well, let's just get Motorhead then. He was like, yes, please. Can we? (laughs) So I think I'd be a fool, even if it crosses over between our list, I'd be a fool not to give that a slot on my own personal list. Yeah. I, I really believe that this is one of the most perfect pairings that you could ever come up with. I mean, there's some areas that you can say, you know, okay, yeah, it's a good idea, but it doesn't really meld. Well, I forget who it is that used, um, kill switch engage. Um, so there's Fire actually, Burns. uh, I think was that CM punk. So, Kill Switch has actually been used a few times. Ray Mysterio's theme song for like a hot minute was by Kill Switch. Was that it? Might, that might have also just been for a soundtrack. I know CM Punk used Kill Switch Engage as well, but for the, a little time. But to be for the purpose of the example, it's a killer band. I love Kill Switch, but it doesn't work in the capacity of no, wrestling. Of course. Yeah, the cult of personality. It worked for CM Punk, but you didn't feel CM Punk in it. I think it's one of those, because CM Punk's been gone for so long, just to hear that riff and knowing his connection to the song, that's why it pops. This is because you're like, wait, he's actually here? Right, exactly. It, it's yeah. it's not the, the full embodiment of a character. Um, side note. Yes. 
Did you ever see? So I th- they live streamed the memorial service for Lemmy. I saw and I heard the story. Um, but so I mean, everyone spoke beautifully. A bunch of artists spoke. Yep. And then literally at the last, it was they were about to end it, but then suddenly the manager goes, "All right, H, you're up. Let's do it real quick." And I thought that was actually really special that they still let him speak, even though they were like Dave Grohl had spoken, like Matt Sorum. Like all these big name rock stars, and they were like, "No, it's important for Triple H to speak." And he, yeah, he did such a beautiful job at highlighting how different the two of them were in real life, personality wise. But yet, they still had such an amazing respect and love for each other. Well, you know what? It might even be more so than some of the other people who spoke, who you know knew him over the years in. Uh, got got to know him, you know, as like, like through working relationships and things like that. But then to have Triple H on a friend level, because if you yeah. listen to the story that he told, when when um, Triple H went backstage and he brought Stephanie with him, <laughs> it was it, it was like you know classic Lemmy, you know, it, still I being a gentleman though, still being still being a gentleman. <laughs> he was, uh, I think, in his underwear like a like a load of blow on the table with like, like naked girls women. everywhere. And he's and like, then, Oh yeah. Like bring triple H. And then suddenly, and then Stephanie shows, Oh, you know, Stephanie goes, he's like, give me five minutes, clean everything <laughs> up, completely <laughs> respectful. So it's like, they, they were actually friends. Yeah. It, it's totally different than a, a working relationship with him. And to have him, I think speak so late, I think might've been the wrong thing. That's just me. I, I, think, I don't, I don't know everything about what went on. I'm not I mean, that to happened know. days after he passed away. And I think that, and that wasn't, that wasn't just a, Oh, for you know, purchase fifteen dollar tickets to go be a part of memor- the memorial service. The coffin was there, like it was an it was in a church. Like this was like a private event that at the very last minute they were like, "Can is there any reason why we can't live stream it? No, let's just do it." Like it wasn't like some of these like massive like rock star events that like you fans that it's for the fans. It was literally a private friends right. only ceremony that at, it was obvious at the very last minute they were like. Yeah, let's live stream it. Why not? And then Triple H. So I don't. Spoke th- I don't think it was like ever like any mouth. I think it was really more so. They don't even think they had a plan as to who was to speak. It was like, oh really? Does anyone See, I, that to, I didn't know. I th- I think it was literally like, all right, who would like to speak? And it might have just been the manager was like, all right, I know H, you got something to say. Come on, I know you do. Like, like so. I don't think it was anything okay. like malice or planned. I think it was just literally like the, the emotions were going through the room, uh, which made that even more special. Also, to kind of highlight how close they were. There's a really great documentary called Lemmy. They got to follow Lemmy around for a year or two. Uh, and and that must also, have been a hell of a time. Oh, yeah. I mean, well, it's funny because, like, you'd think it was crazy wild, but then they, it really showed, like, the, the private and calm moments of Lemmy's life. Um, I actually have become friends with one of the co-directors who's such a great guy. Wes, thank you for, for all you do for Motorhead, by the way. A uh, little shout out to him. They also interview a bunch of people about how important Motorhead was. And they actually got to talk to Triple H with Lemmy next to him. And Triple H recalls the story about it was just the two of them hanging out. Maybe it was in the studio or just somewhere. And suddenly Lemmy just goes, so Triple H, when you like tore your leg, like you, you got injured, were you afraid that like, oh man, this is, this is it. My career is over. And Triple H was like, honestly, yeah, I was, I was definitely scared. And then Lemmy just going, yeah, I, I kind of had that feeling when I got the first diagnosed with diabetes. And Triple H is just like taking it back. Like the fact that Lemmy was revealing a personal like that with him just speaks volumes. So that's a long-winded way of saying uh, the Motorhead and Triple H bromance is definitely in our final three. Yeah, it has so to be. I think we can move forward and agree that that's the first yes. one. I would also agree about Chris Jericho and Fozzie's, Chris Jericho's use of Judas. Mm-hmm. Um Partially because I think, I mean, I'm really, I am excited about AEW and I think there's a lot of cool potential with the brand and I'd like to see, I hope, I'm excited to see how it evolves. What I love about that particular moment though, is just to reemphasize that now that fans are singing along to it, I love, I love AEW because it's obvious they listen to the fans. It's obvious that if, you know, they can, if fans aren't really feeling a storyline and are focal about it, they'll find ways to work around it or to find ways to like incorporate it into the storyline in some way. And I think them capturing how, oh, wow, fans are actually singing along 
to Judas, let's encourage this. And now it's like a thing mm-hmm. that like they, and Chris Jericho is a master at like, he comes up with a catchphrase and he makes sure that that, if it catches fire, he makes sure to spread it as much as possible. He's a great marketer in that regards. So I think without a doubt that has to be number two. Okay. So that, that means, and this is why I would really strongly beg for all the reasons I already talked about that Cindy Lauper <laughs> should be number three. And I think it highlights also how it's not just all head banging metal and rock. I, that the I, wrestling has, has found ways to, to slip in other genres of music and go into mainstream. And they have, and I think Cindy Lauper for that time, I don't think she, she was a little pop, but she was also, you know, almost like that Madonna edge with a little more rock to her. But the only reason why I'm going to kind of push back a little bit on this is because NXT was created specifically with this idea in mind of music. It was, it was a melding between the worlds of wrestling and the world of of rock and metal. I, I'm going to push back on this though, because while I appreciate what they're doing with NXT, I would also argue it's not like it's the first time that the worlds of rock and metal have met, that the worlds of hard rock and wrestling have met. But it's the whole program, though. It's not. <laughs> but, it's not just an instance. It's not just you know one person. It's for everybody what they're doing in they're doing it in this this platform where we're we're trying to find ways to find what's cool out there and bring it in. Listen, I love that code orange who is a really cool, really awesome band right now and really in, innovative that they got such exposure like they did uh, by appearing on NXT. But to me Cindy Larber just appearing at WrestleMania one, let alone all the other wrestling appearances she did had a much bigger impact on wrestling. And I think had a, it had a much bigger reaction from the outside, from both wrestling fans and non wrestling fans than code orange appearing on NXT or Lizzie Hailstorm appearing on NXT. Like to me, I think Cindy Larper is, connection and role in WWF 80s wrestling is much more impactful and is criminally underreported even though it's definitely well you it just gets reported a, it well and there's a lot of people that reported to I I to, it's not let me rephrase that criminally underreported by WWE okay because WWE does a great job at trying to rewrite history <laughs> and you that's, mean they but that's a whole out? that's a whole different topic for a whole different episode right. too but so you you really really love this cindy Lauper thing yes and i think it's a fair compromise to say motorhead and triple h bromance chris jericho's judas in AEW, and cindy Lauper's role in the wwf 80s scene you know it's fair you know it's right yeah but i want the clean sweep <laughs> you're a dick you yes. know you know I know, you know but I'm right. I uh, see. You I know think, I'm right. No, I don't I think that give, you're right. I don't think, I'll, and I'll, right. tell you, I'll tell you. And I'll tell you why. I'll give you, you, you NXT not, as a, as an honorary mention too. Listen here, brother. You're not right. <laughs> I'm totally right. No, you're not. Am. No, I'm. So I'm gonna say that you're not right. I'll give you Cindy Lauper, but you're not right because you want to talk about what is going to forward rock and metal into that next level to kind of bring it back to the forefront. And it's going to be a major, another major brand to to bring that back. It's going to have to be a, a, a melding with something. It's not going to be like, obviously be with like baseball or football or anything like that. But wrestling and like rock and metal, they kind of just go hand in hand. But so, I don't. I would argue that NXT wouldn't have been able to be in that position if it wasn't for Cindy Lauper I helping bring no, in mainstream fans in the WWE not, in the eighties. Not true. No, Hogan. Hogan was the one who did that. I, not Cindy Lauper. You can't even argue with that. Hulk Hogan was the eighties. But at the same time, mainstream press were reporting WrestleMania because of the star power that was attached to it. Hulk Hogan, yeah, he was a big star. But he was still a wrestler. Mr. Correct. T was a huge Hollywood star. Then, I, then we can argue that Mr. T. I would argue that. that Mr. T and Cindy Lauper just as much. But are you willing to at least to make peace? Say that the final three is Cindy Lauper, 
Triple H Motorhead and Chris Jericho's Judas in AEW with a major honorary plaque <laughs> given to NXT. I will, I will, fine, I'll go with the list in that way. However, you, the listener, I want you just to take note, write this down somewhere that on this podcast I said this, and in a few years, when certain bands start to blow up because they were on NXT, come back on this video and comment and say that he was right. Or comment at Matt Gamba saying, suck it. Get it, DX. Uh, that was a great oh, theme song, too. That was overplayed. That I theme always song? thought that was Rage Against the Machine. It, well, it was obviously recorded to make you think yes. it was Rage Against the Machine. I, You know, <laughs> D, DX the first time was great. DX the second time was eh. DX the third time was well, like, hold on. come on. Uh, let's Hold on. Let's define which era of DX you're We're, talking about. So first era of DX, you're talking about Shawn Michaels and Triple H. I'm talking the entirety of DX at that time. So Shawn Michaels, Triple H, Road Dog, Billy Gunn, China. That, that's, that's, hold on. No, no, no. That's separate. No, that's together. No. Yeah. Shawn Michaels wasn't even there. He was, was injured when... He was there in the beginning. He and, wasn't really a part of DX when Road Dog and, and Billy Gunn and Xbox that was still in. the first run of DX before DX was no more. So you're going to count that as all as one? I'm counting that whole thing as one. Okay. That whole run. All right. Well, then in that case, everything after that was shit. Exactly. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Okay. We're done. <laughs> but I don't really know if I agree that Sean, to lump that. I guess you could. I don't know. It was all at the same time. There was never a run at that time where they did not exist. Hot take. Were you more of an NWO kid or DX kid? Uh, NWO. And I'll tell you why. Because at that point I was watching Nitro more than I was watching Raw. I started off as NWO, but then DX... You know what? And it's funny because I feel like NWO was both responsible... For WCW's peak and responsible for their decline. And because the, NWO became too big for its own good. And a lot of people feel the same way too. Yeah. I think that... And I say the, that as someone who loves NWO. And they're getting inducted into it, the Hall of Fame. It felt it felt real. Like it, it felt like these guys were actually taking over. It felt yeah. like this was something that, you know, it was a virus that WCW couldn't stop at the time. Yeah. But... Once they started to do, you know, everybody's a member of the NWO. And then there was NWO Black and NWO Red, or uh, uh, Red and then White. NWO um, Hollywood versus NWO yeah. Wolfpack. Yeah, exactly. I was Wolfpack, personally, myself. Well, all, everybody went that way. Because that, well, they, that's how that they was the, That was the cool but side. Then, but then to find out it was all just a scheme with the infamous poke that Kevin, like that yeah. Hulk Hogan gave Kevin Nash, and it was all a scheme, like... That was silly. Right. And it, just really devalued the whole thing itself. Right. And then everybody had their own little spinoffs. Like, uh, I think the the Latin guys had their own thing. LWO. Um, and then the parodies in ECW with BWO. There's just so much silliness that yeah. came out of that toward the end. So if it stayed the legitimate thing that it should have been, it would have been better off. So uh, what apparently it was, it was supposed to kind of help them create their own nwo show and create like make that its own almost wrestling league so that like almost if in theory nwo was night show and then wcw was thunder was i think what was the initial hope but what ended up happening was bischoff just did not know how to end uh, sorry let me rephrase that eric bischoff in case for those who are listening who don't know real wrestling uh he just did not know how to end the storyline and it ended up being the death of wcw yeah which is because there was, man, 98, 99, they were giving WWF a run for its money even during the w, the Attitude Era. Oh, yeah. And they took over the ratings on Monday night, if I'm not mistaken. It took a, it took WWF a while to regain the lead. Yeah, I didn't I didn't like Raw at that time. I, I really preferred WCW. I started liking W. I started with WCW because of Hulk Hogan, going back to how power, like a huge. OK, so was. all right. That's when that's when you um, picked it up when he went there. Pretty much. And also because when you go back to like watching the classic WWF stuff, it's Hulk Hogan and Macho Man. Where are they now? WCW. And then also Sting and Goldberg, they were huge and massive. But then I started to get more into WWF because it was a little bit more, no pun intended, raw than WCW. It felt a little bit edgier. And if you're going to tell me that Stone Cold Steve Austin isn't the most badass mf -er in wrestling... You need to leave right now because when you hear that glass shatter, shatter, it's just 
done. Well, it has over. to be. So it has cool. to be to the right theme. And then even D- DX, I started to like DX a little bit more because they were a little bit funnier. It wasn't the massive. Oh, we're we're no match can end up going in the good guy's favor because there's too many NWO members to change the verdict. Whereas it was an actual gang of five funny, awesome guys who and China just, and China who just went off the rails and did whatever they wanted to do. Even if it meant getting, fu- even if you know, the powers that be weren't happy about it. So it kind of go- went into the role of, all right, NW is the authority, whether you like it or not to, all right, DX is the guys who are saying, screw you to the authority. We don't need power to do whatever we want. So I think that's why I started going in the DX route toward the end. Yeah, and then I think I just stopped watching for a while, and then I came back to it. I think the moment I stopped watching was Wrestle, one of the WrestleManias. I want to say it's either 2002, 2003. It was the match between Brock Lesnar and Goldberg, or Steve Austin, as the referee. It was supposed to be this awesome match, and you can end. I think that was later. It was a little bit later after you stopped watching it, but it was the you just watch it, and both. Goldberg and Brock Lesnar, their contracts were up and you could just tell they yep. didn't care. They didn't care anymore. And the yeah. fans I, I knew and they chanted that. it. And it had and Steve Austin had to come in and save the day by st- stunning both of them. I don't even think either of them won. I don't I don't know. Uh, it, it was just like such a bad man. I'm like, you know what? This is I'm done. Yeah, the last couple And it of- took a while for me to finally get back. Like so I honestly I remember some of the early days of Ruthless Aggression, but I was pretty much done by I in fact I didn't even realize until recently that they even officially named that era of WWE. Yeah, they, yeah, they, <laughs> that, uh, the last couple of matches that I remember watching were the, I forget, I know the one was WrestleMania where yeah. Brock Lesnar broke his neck with the, the shooting star press on yeah. Kurt Angle. And the match, I think it was actually also between Goldberg and Eddie Guerrero where Eddie won the title for the first time. And I think that was also the same night that Benoit won the title for the yes. first time. Which so, it's funny because you would think that would have been the, the one moment that WWE was like, oh my God, we had this classic moment that's so sad to watch now, but now they can't even show it for obvious reasons. Yes. Yeah. Which is even more heartbreaking because, yeah, they really can't show it. That is probably one of the most random sidetrack conversations we've had on this podcast. But what did you think? <laughs> Did you agree with our take and our list? Because our final list was to go back, Triple H and Motorhead, Chris Jericho and AEW, and then Zach's um, in, uh, entry. All with, of ours. Cindy <laughs> Lauper's Cindy Lauper. role in, in 80s <laughs> WWF. Do you agree? Let us know on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, whatever form of communication they used in, in the 80s to connect fans with WWF wrestlers. I guess mail. Mail? Postcards. Or that, an, or that weird WWE birthday line. Did you ever hear The Undertaker sing Happy Birthday? No, I didn't. I will show you the video. This is epic. But <laughs> let us you, know. Did you like Did you like this podcast? Should we do more wrestling talk? Let us know. Uh, I'm going to say no, but let us know. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for listening, and we hope you tune into a more music-themed episode, we swear. Thanks, guys. Take it easy. Take it easy.